Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, friends and family of the Shuleys. I'd like to welcome you at this time to the memorial service of Mary Fran Shuley. This afternoon, we get to celebrate, honor, and remember the life and legacy of a godly woman. In this time of grief and sorrow, I hope we can find solace and hope in the words of the Apostle Paul found in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. The Apostle Paul says this in verse 16, he says, For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of an archangel, with the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be with the Lord forever. He ends the chapter with these words. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, Lord, you are the giver of life. You are the giver of all good things. And Lord, we thank you for the years that you have blessed us with Mary Fran. Thank you for her sweet love to others. Thank you for the godly example and legacy that she leaves for us. And thank you for blessing her or blessing us with her. And Father, as we take some time this afternoon to celebrate her life. I pray that you would bless us with your presence. Lord, during this time of grieving and during this time of sorrow, may you be very close to us. And Father, may we find hope in the promise of your soon return, that on resurrection morning, we will again be reunited with Mary Fran. Lord, thank you for this hope and this promise. And I pray that you be very close to us at this time. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Good afternoon, all. Uh, My name is Quentin Shuley. I am Mary Fran's grandson. And I'll be reading the obituary today for anyone that hasn't gotten a chance to read it yet. Mary Frances Shuley, 81, passed peacefully on Monday, February 18, 2019, surrounded by her family. She was preceded in death by the love of her life and husband, Robert R. Shuley, Sr., in 1983. Her parents, Frank J. Sweetall, Sr., and Mary V. Conley Sweetall, preceded her in death, as did her six siblings, Jack J. Sweetall, Robert B. Sweetall, Donald W. Sweetall, Muriel Flaus, D. D. Rowene Butler, and Audrey McGrogan. Mary Fran is survived by her three sons, Robert R. and Karen Shuley, Jr., Damien J. and Sharon Shuley, and Kevin C. and Jackie Shuley. Grandchildren, Ashley Shuley, Brandon Shuley, Ashley and Keith Borgia, Joseph Goulet, Dominic Shuley, Anthony Shuley, Nicolo Shuley, Quentin Shuley, and Olivia Shuley. Great-granddaughter Riley Borgia, as well as many nieces, nephews, and cousins, and friends around the globe. Mary Fran's life was devoted to the Lord and her family. She is known to her grandchildren as Grammy, Grams, and Kinsel. She was happy to share her joy of life and love of the Lord, and she lived her life as an example of this to all she met. Franny, as her varsity cheerleading squad knew her, was proud to have been the secretary of her Dormont High School senior class for over 60 years. As a member of the Worthington Seventh-day Adventist Church, she served many roles. This included Pathfinder Director, Elder, and Sabbath School Teacher. She thought every event needed cookies, and she was happy to bake them. She was active in the Worthington Hills Civic Association for 50 years. She proudly worked at Affiliated Dermatology for 36 years and continued to work part-time until her death. Mary Fran Shuley lived the life in service to others. 
She was a devoted wife, mother, sister, aunt, grandmother, great-grandmother, and friend. She did not fear death. Her faith remained strong, and she passed knowing that the next face she saw would be that of her Lord and Savior when he returns to take his faithful flock to heaven. Hi, I'm Diana Southard, a very good friend of Mary Fram's. About a year ago, Mary Fram went to my daughter, my oldest daughter, Penny, better known by Mary Fran as Penny Lynn, and asked her if she would sing at her funeral. Penny said yes, but she didn't want to talk about it. <laughs> so um, Mary Fran said to her, look, this is part of life and I need to know you're gonna sing at my funeral. So of course she said she would. Then Mary Fran asked me if I would introduce her when she sings at her funeral, <laughs> still a year ago. And um, she also asked me if I would tell a story about how my family came to call her Tom Tom. We've called her that for many, many years, like, uh, uh, my daughter's 42, 42 or 40, 41 or 42 years. When Penny, my daughter, was a baby, she started and was starting to talk, she started saying Tom Tom. I'm going, what is Tom Tom? What is she trying to tell us? Mary Fran came over one day and I told her, Penny's saying something about a Tom Tom and I don't know what, what she's talking about. So we just let it go that eventually we'd probably figure it out. Well, one day Penny and I were up in her bedroom and there was a window by her bed and she was looking out the door, out the window, and she said, there's Tom Tom. And I ran over and I looked out and I said, is Mary Fran Tom Tom? And she said, yeah. And Kevin was out there with her also. And she said, that's Tom Tom and Kevin's the goat. <laughs> and I said, the goat? Well, Kevin had been a ghost for, for Halloween that year. So he was the goat. So um, <laughs> anyway, the, the mystery was finally solved. Uh, Mary Fran was in fact Tom Tom and Kevin was the goat. <laughs> <laughs> so from that day forward, Mary Fran has been Tom Tom to my family, my kids, my grandkids, me, all of us. Mary Fran finally figured out why she called her Tom Tom. She used to put Penny and Terry, my other daughter, on her lap and bounce them up and down and say, Tommy, 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 whoops, Tommy, and drop them down to the floor and pull them back up. So that's we're assuming where Tom, com Tom came from. Well, that little one-year-old girl is now all grown up, and Penny Lynn is going to sing Amazing Grace at Tom Tom's request. And grace my fears 
relieved how precious did that grace appear the hour I first believed my chains are gone I've been set free my God my Savior has ransomed me and like a flood his mercy reigns unending love amazing grace promised good to me his word my hope secures he will my shield and portion as long as life endures my chains are gone set free my God my Savior has ransomed me and like a flood his mercy reigns unending love amazing grace my chains are gone My God, my Savior, has ransomed me, and like a flood, His mercy brings unending love, amazing grace. shall soon dissolve like snow. The sun forbear to shine. But God, who called me here the Lord, will be forever mine. Will be forever mine you are forever I'm Tim McGrogan, Mary Fran's nephew and godson. Inspired by a song he likes, Damien wrote a tribute to his mom. I'm honored that he asked me to read it. Some of Mary Fran's newer friends might not know she was born and raised in Pittsburgh, and some references you hear relate to those times and places in the Berg. Sad but true. When the fog comes down the Allegheny and the moon shines on the Mon, everything has changed now that you have gone. Things are getting darker and it's harder for me to see, but now you are an angel looking over me. Rewind it, rewind it. It's what I want, it's what I want. Not now, not today, not now, not today. Sad but true, but the list is too long. If I had to name you all, it wouldn't fit in this song. This magnum has got me thinking, and it's making me pissed. Your life was taken too early, and you will always be missed. 
for all the family who cry and all the friends who mourn. For every life taken, there is another child born. It doesn't make better and it doesn't make it right. I'm just thankful every day you were a part of my life. Rewind it, rewind it. It's what I want, it's what I want. Not now, not today. Not now, not today. In your dreams, you take a trip down to Dormont, to Green Tree, up the hill to the steps of St. Bernard's, then Beacon Hill and Shenley Park. You pass Oakland, you pass York Way, you go to Duquesne, down to Three Rivers, take the streetcar to Fifth Avenue, go down Manila, yeah, and follow the bus stop to Green Tree Road. Ah, uh, Green Tree Road. Yeah, it's reoccurring, but it's not a dream. It's your life. You've lived it a thousand times. Yeah, but it's always like the very first time. As life goes on, I can never forget all the times we had, memories I will protect. Seems like yesterday when I last saw your face. You're no longer here, no one can replace. All the times we had, wish they could happen again. I'll hold you in my heart, in my heart to the end. If I could make a change, it would be me, not you. So hard to see you go, so sad but true. Rewind it, rewind it, it's what I want, it's what I want. Not now, not today, not now, not today. Okay. And then uh, I kind of wrote a little something myself, so this will be the uh, Godson addendum, yeah. I saw a sympathy card once that read, God gave us memories that we might have roses in December. I remember that quote whenever a family member or friend passes on. One small but ever-present consolation is we still have countless memories we can call to mind whenever we want, anytime we want. It's like carrying around a mental DVD player in that we can think of a particular memory repeatedly or simply change it to another one anytime we feel like it. If one recollection makes us sad, we switch the channel to one of the many that makes us laugh or feel good or is just plain interesting. For instance, I can remember when my mother-in-law was looking at a photo album asking, who's this girl that looks like Elizabeth Taylor? It was a photograph of a uh, teenage Mary Fran. My cousin Jimmy Green's father died in World War II somewhere in France. Details of where he was buried were unknown. Mary Fran got on the case, contacted authorities abroad, found the cemetery, and even got photographs of the gravesite. I recall when a friend of Mary Fran's was ill, and he had worked at an Isley store in his youth. Mary Fran began a scavenger hunt and obtained for him Isley's artifacts including a scoop to make Isley's skyscraper ice cream cones. That would be a treasure for anyone who grew up in Pittsburgh. I'd like to have one. <laughs> I'm sure many of you know that if Mary Fran undertook a mission to find something odd, it was just a matter of time until mission accomplished. My wife and I were watching a TV documentary one night when I turned to her and said, why don't they just get Mary Fran to find out what happened to Jimmy Hoffa? <laughs> when I first saw my granddaughter doing cheerleader cartwheels and backflips, I flashed back to Mary Fran practicing those moves across our dining room when she babysitted me and my sisters. That's just a few examples of memories I'll switch the channel to. I'm sure everyone here has numerous ones. So if you start feeling sad, change the channel. Change the channel to a memory that makes you smile. We all know that Mary Fran would have wanted it that way, and we all know that her husband Bob would second the motion. Thank you.
I'm Sharon Shilley, Damien's wife, lucky enough to have Mary Fran as my mother-in-law. We've reached that part of Mary Fran's life that was most dear and cherished, and the one that brought her happiness that literally lasted her whole life, and that is the love she had for her husband, and he had for her. We knew him as Bob, Uncle Bobby, Dad, Grampy Bob, and yes, Mr. Shuley. I was fortunate to have known him before he passed away in January of 1983. One thing to note, Bob was born and buried on the Sabbath. Mary Fran was also born on the Sabbath, and her number one wish was to be buried on the Sabbath, just like her beloved Bob. It took some doing, given the constraints of the cemetery, um, but it all worked out. To highlight and try and share with those who may not have known them as a couple and the love that Mary Fran had for her husband and he for her, I recently came across two letters that were written by a wife and mother that showcased that love and that life that they shared for 24 years. These writings so beautifully describe the magic they shared that I want to read them to you today. The first letter was dated June 20th, 1982, right around Father's Day. It reads as follows. Dear Father of our children, how seldomly I get to write you a love letter. Mr. Hallmark always says it in a much more extravagant, flowery way. But the thought and the love are the same. I am happy that I picked you to be the father of the children I hoped to have. They surely couldn't ask for anyone else who is more loving, supportive, encouraging, and understanding than you. You are always there when they need you and when I need you. It's an overwhelming job raising a family, and I'm glad you're my partner in that venture. Thank you also for providing a father figure in my own life. It's nice having a real daddy. May our Father in Heaven continue to bless you and guide you in all you do, but especially when you are fathering the three precious gifts he sent us, your devoted wife. The second letter was dated June 19, 1983, and it reads as follows. A Father's Day tribute to the father of my children. The father of my children had to be someone very special, someone who was sensitive, patient, caring, and understanding. That's why I made the choice I did. Those special traits of his were outshone only by his never-ending devotion to them and to me. Even before they were born, the interest and excitement of the anticipation of their birth always made me feel very special, as if I were the only one in the whole world who was able to accomplish the miracle of reproduction. How we always were in awe of the Creator's way of producing new life. When these little bundles arrived, he was so proud and it goes without saying, relieved mother and baby were fine. He then set his little routine in motion of notifying relatives, friends, and the florist. A dozen beautiful red roses would arrive promptly with endearing words attached. His secretary told me recently how his voice crackled with pride and emotion when he called in the order and the message. At the first whimper during the night, he was on his way to the bassinet to attend to the needs of the babies. And then he brought them to me, wrapped snugly and comfy for feeding. On other occasions, when they weren't able to settle themselves, day or night, he always loved to hold them and rock them. In fact, a few times he'd be standing looking out the window, swaying from side to side, with the baby sound asleep in the next room. Yes, he logged many hours on that circuit, the father of my children. The first teeth, the first time he, call, he was called Dada, the first steps, 
All were situations for him to beam with pride and intense interest. They grew quickly and soon were involved in many other activities such as swimming, bike riding, ball playing, all with their father's watchful eye nearby. Graduating to some big kid adventures such as rock climbing and scuba diving had him trying very hard not to worry, but nonetheless expressing very strong concern. He didn't hold them back, but gave them support and encouragement. And yes, he did worry about them. So many events could be recounted, but most of all, he gave them his time, his love, and his example of what an earthly father and husband should be, what a heritage he has given them. In knowing how their earthly father cared for them, they have a foretaste of how their heavenly father cares for them. They were able to observe and understand his deep spiritual feelings and how he stood in awe of the handiwork of our master. The years slipped by, and when our youngest joined the others away at college, the house seemed awfully empty to him, and the father missed his children. In those first few days of rattling around the house, I found him in an empty room, misty-eyed. When I inquired, he said, it all just went too fast. Yes, the father of my children was many things to them and to me. Not only was he my husband, but in some respects, he was a father figure to me also. Maybe that's why even I called him daddy and remembered him with something special on Father's Day. That something special this year is this tribute to him, a tribute to his love and guidance and wisdom for all of us. He's gone now, and I miss him deeply. He was right. It all went just too fast. I'm thankful to have had him as long as I did, the father of my children. Well, as I'm sure you guessed it, the mother and wife who wrote these letters was, in fact, Mary Fran. One letter written the Father's Day prior to Bob's death and the second letter on the Father's Day following his death. She was right. It all went too fast. The daughter, sister, wife, mother, mother-in-law, aunt, grandmother, great-grandmother, and friend. We are thankful to have had her as long as we did. So it goes, some things 
are meant to be. Take my hand, take my whole life too, for I can help falling in love with you like a river flow. Surely to the sea, darling, so it goes. Some things are meant to be. Take my hand, take my whole life too. Falling in love with you, for I can help falling in love with you. I was asked to share some memories about Mary Fran and her work at Affiliated Dermatology. She took a chance back in the day on this young upstart doctor and joined us in 1986, expanding my staff at the time by a third. She was a people person's people person, upbeat, warm, articulate, and caring, the perfect person for representing us to the public. Her starting phrase to me in the morning was, Good morning to you, we're all in our places with bright shiny faces. And when asked how she was doing, it was fine and dandy lions. If uh, on occasion our, our OR nurse was off, she would uh, come up and say, I'm ready to scrub in. She was always looking for the good in people and usually found it. For the occasional grouchy patient, she was an even match, killing them with kindness. She was once seen by one of her co-workers, calmly holding the phone away from her ear, the raging verbiage flowing. When it slackened, she put the phone back to her ear and they'd ask, are you still there? And she said in that lovely voice, I wanted to wait till you were finished. Jackie and I used to host an annual AD Christmas party for staff members and their significant others. Mary Fran brought Kevin and Damien on alternate years. Lucky for Robert, he lived out of town so he didn't get drafted. We'd have a small gift exchange where each person's gift was placed in the center of the circle. Often there'd be one or two handmade items by staff, which were usually the most popular. People selected a package in their turn, and as open gifts became available for trade, much commandeering prevailed. The key was that once a gift had been traded three times, it was safely kept by the current owner. Team Shuley soon had the game figured out. They ruled like the legendary chess grandmasters, thinking several moves ahead and usually took home a coveted prize. No one treasured such an item more than Mary Fran, however, so it was all good. As mom to three boys, Mary Fran was very aware of the demands on Jackie raising our three boys. So as a gift one time, she watched our crew allowing us to take a short vacation. Mary Fran kept our boys interested and quite busy the whole time. They were actually uh, upset to see us come back. In the late 1990s, Mary Fran retired for a time, but then came back to work, I think, for filling in for someone on maternity leave, and then for someone's vacation, and ended up staying on pretty much full time, 
until her recent illness in 2016. Even then, her desire was to work on. Finally had to limit her hours because I knew she couldn't be feeling very good. But she was so darn dedicated. She brought us strength and her determination was inspirational. There exists in my files dozens of handwritten notes I recently reviewed that she sent me over the years, encouraging or sympathizing, or thanking me. Many of you have similar notes, a plethora of caring cards and letters that she's written to you. Her sincerity, decency, and kind soul will stay with us forever, and we will dearly miss her, as will Hallmark. If the idea is to die young as late as possible, Mary Fran pulled it off. Never growing old in a traditional sense, she saw through young eyes and thought young, moving through the seasons of her life with dignity, humor, and kindness. Mary Fran was a genuinely optimistic person who faced the future with courage and joy. Her love of life shined through to all of us that she engaged with. The horizons she saw were bright and hopeful, making us believe that anything was possible. Mary Fran knew how to be a true and loyal friend, honoring and nurturing us with her generous and giving soul. I'll close with the following Mary Oliver poem, I believe captures Mary Fran's essence, as one not caught up in her own story, but working to make the world a better place. I go down to the shore in the morning, and depending on the hour, the waves are rolling in or moving out, and I say, oh, I am miserable. What shall, what should I do? And the sea says in its lovely voice, excuse me, I have work to do. When someone passes away, I always, I always think to myself, I wonder if they really knew what an influence they were on people and how much really people cared about them. And I hope that Mary Fran knew, because as I look at you, each one of you here, you're here because you had a special love for Mary Fran. It almost sounds too good to be true that there was a person like this, but because you all have known her so well and so long, you know that it's true. Everything that we have been saying about her is true, and it's interesting that many of our comments uh, are the same. When you share a common faith, a common journey, experiences, when your road takes many different turns like hers did in her life, and you become friends with someone who shares that kind of commitment and that same kind of feeling about the thing that is the most precious to you, your spiritual journey. You become friends like no one else could. And you stay friends for a lifetime, even if you never see each other. But when you do see each other, it's like you saw each other a few minutes ago. And you always have another faith-based story to tell each other because that's how you began to share the friendship. And that's the way it was with Mary Fran. One day, it was the first day of our vacation Bible school here at the church, and about uh, Damon and I figured it was about 1968. I received a call from the church office asking me if I could pick up three boys on Crawford Drive and bring them to Bible school. I had never met these boys, but I said, well, yeah, I can pick them up. So I picked them up. Robert, Kevin was about here, well, Damien and Robert. And at that time we had Bible school for two weeks. And I picked them up every day for two weeks. And that's how I got to know Mary Fran, was by bringing her children to Vacation Bible School. 
And then we met Bob, and then that family met my family. And from the first day, it seemed like we shared something very special and very common and very easy. It never was difficult. It was always very easy. Little by little, Mary Fran became more interested in our church. She was baptized and thus began many years of our working together, sharing, crying, listening, visiting, witnessing, and eventually family vacationing together. We could write a whole book about just one vacation we took, which was a houseboat adventure. So I think we're going to have to get together a short story and have that published because each person there from their own vantage has just a lot of fun things to say. Ask Robert about running to the bed every time we pulled into the dock because he was embarrassed of how we were driving. That's just one little thing. So Mary and I, Mary Fran and I, you may not know this, we were the first people to sell uh, fruit for the school. The fruit program before we took it over was a private enterprise and the lady was going to give it up and so we decided to turn it into a school project. And Mary Fran was classic. Let me tell you, she was classic. She delivered boxes of, boxes of fruit to people if they couldn't make it or if they missed or if they wanted a certain size or if they had a bad orange or whatever. She would, she would take the box of fruit to them. She sold them on her job. She took them to, I think it was Singer, sold them on the job. She always had her trunk full. She sold them out of her living room front door. And with her family in mind, we continued the program for several years. And we were almost up to two truckloads of fruit when we quit. It seemed if uh, I got involved, uh, she got involved. And if she got involved, it seemed like I got involved. So there are too many stories to tell about all of these years of mutual sharing. But one of the biggest highlights has got to be our years with the Pathfinders. Um, we did it every way. Sometimes both families were the leaders. Sometimes the two men were the leaders. Sometimes Mary Fran and I were the leaders. Sometimes I was the leader. Some, I mean, it just how, however it had to go. And one thing that we had for sure, Bob was a veteran. And at that time, we had a dynamic drill team. I don't know how many kids we had. I would say we had 20, 25 kids. And that's when the Ohio Conference always had a drill, um, a drill team competition, and usually our club won. And Bob had them really walking like soldiers, and he just took no, no guff from them. And so that was just really fun for the kids. And the other highlight has got to be Mary Fran and I never been camping in our life and going to the Columbia Union Campery in Pennsylvania. And um, the journey started with, I was driving Caitlin Heisel's husband's monster truck, I think. And Mary Fran was in, I think maybe jo Joan Harding's old orange Volkswagen bus. I, one of us, or maybe that was Linda, I don't know. Every bump we hit, my fender would take a little bit of rubber off the tires. So we went in a stressful mood all the way. We finally made it. Set up this beautiful camp. Oh, it was gorgeous. Even had a food tent. We were so proud of ourselves, had a food tent. Had baked potatoes in the coals. It was wonderful. And the next night, the first night it started snowing. And all those little girls with their sleepover bags were freezing. And the next morning, it's pouring. And we see the campers. They have a meeting with the leaders, and the campers are all pulling out. And we just look at each other. Everything is covered in mud. Everything is wet. All the kids are wet and muddy. We don't know what to do, so we say, well, we're staying, because we don't know how to break camp in this condition. <laughs> so we stayed. And the next morning, uh, Linda, Caitlin here, she went to a gas station and practically um, tore it down, pounding on the door, making them open it so we could rent a trailer. She brought the trailer back to camp. We picked up wet tents, mud, 
scrambled eggs and water with skills with full of water and we just threw everything right in that trailer and took us all day to break camp we didn't know how wrapped the kids in trash bags the night before because they were all wet and we didn't know how to keep them dry <laughs> and then on our way home this was before cell phones so we couldn't tell people what we we're doing we go to a McDonald's and our kids were so wet and muddy and dirty, they asked us to leave. <laughs> Just another highlight. <laughs> but when we got back, you know, this was the usual activity. Mary Fran and I were doing something that most husbands don't understand. So here they are. Where have you been? What have you been doing? You know, it was late at night. And we said, we don't even want to talk about it. Don't even want to talk about it. Here we are. But it was a wonderful time. It was a wonderful time of serving the children, of really growing up with them, of being a part of what they were doing. Mary Fran was always involved in Sabbath school teaching. She started with a kindergarten section in the old church on Griswold Street, in that little room in the basement on the west side of the church in the basement, and the only prop that she had, keep in mind Sabbath school people, we have a prop now for every song. The only prop that she had were children's sized chairs. That was it. They, and you know, we had these little chairs that they all loved. Mary Fran did it all. She told stories and created games and made crafts and she did it all. There was nothing, nothing else. And then she eventually went on she eventually went on to, as the children got older, she went through all the departments. She went to the youth department and then back to the kindergarten department where she stayed for many, many, many years. She did it all. I mean, back then it was, do you need help? Call Mary Fran. Call Mary Fran. And you can't talk about Mary Fran without talking about her husband, Bob. So devoted and loving. An example of family life that would have been a dream for some families to participate in. When he was finally baptized, she was thrilled. The, that decision guided the rest of their lives and made their choices for them. And she always said she was so glad that she became a Seventh-day Adventist. So as a Christian woman, Mary Fran lived how God told us to live. She loved everyone. She helped those in needs. He says to devote your life to family and friends. She did that. Serve your church and community with the gifts that God gives you. Share your faith. But most of all, let the world see Jesus in you. And all these reasons are why I love my friend Mary Fran. And I certainly hope to see her again someday. Thank you. So I'm Dominic Shuley. I'm one of uh, Mary Fran's grandsons. Um, none of us called her Mary Fran or um, Grandma or anything. We knew her as Kind Soul. Um, that's the name that we all came up with because of her um, never-ending kindness and compassion for us as uh, her grandkids. Um, Grandma kind of so watched me for the first six years of my life, more or less. Both of my parents were at work, um, and she took on the responsibility of handling me every day. Um, we had a lot of good times. Um, she let me repaint one of her bathrooms in the house. Um, I think that we needed to repaint that one um, one or two more times, but it was fun. Um, she also taught me how to cook. Um, there were, was never a day where I'd go over there when she'd be watching me where uh, we would be cooking cookies, um, baking cakes, anything. 
Um, there was even one time where uh, she allowed me to pour in the flour to the mixing bowl. And there's a picture somewhere, I, I haven't been able to find it, but I uh, poured all the flour in at once and turned the mixer on high. Um, <laughs> the kitchen was covered in white flour. And I remember I was holding the spoon in my hand with my apron on and turned around and saw um, Graham smiling and cracking up laughing. Um, she thought it was hilarious. And it's the moments like those that I'll remember, all the good times. Um, the times where she had her own three boys that she raised and led an example. Um, of being patient, kind, and compassionate, and they all have uh, transferred that into their own um, adult lives and showing us um, those values as well. But um, she was also a mother to me. Um, like I said, she watched me for six years. Um, if she hadn't told me that she was my gram, I probably would have been calling her mom. Um, she started me in what my life has turned into of gymnastics. Um, without her, I wouldn't be where I am today. Um, and I know she'll be watching me moving forward over the next four years, and I'm gonna do my best to make her proud because I know that that's what she'd want me to do, is to see it through till the end. Um, one more thing is that it was October of 2017. Now, <laughs> our grandma was very famous for her mystery trips, she called them. Um, every birthday she'd take us somewhere and only our parents would know where we were going. Well, myself and my fellow cousins, we thought we'd pull one on her. Um, we got everyone to come to Columbus and she had no idea about it. We told her, Graham, be ready on this evening. Um, I believe it was Quentin that drove her. Um, and be at the Worthington Inn at this time. So she gets to the Worthington Inn, she's surprised, and all the cousins are there. <laughs> she just about fell over. Um, I think that was the last time that all of us were together with her, and it was at her favorite place, the Worthington Inn, which she took us to at every opportunity that she got. And like I said, we got to remember the good times, and that's what I'm going to be striving to do. And she'll always, always be watching us, but um, she's irreplaceable. She was the best person um, and still is the best person I've ever had in my life. My name is Ashley Borja. I had the privilege of joining this group of wonderful grandchildren behind me uh, about 13 years ago uh, when uh, Robert married my mom. And uh, my brother and I got to join this crew and it's, it's been a ball uh, ever since. And I, I will tell you that um, we called her Grammy Mary Fran and uh, we already had two beautiful grandmothers and we got to add a third. And um, I will never forget um, in those 13 years, she, I was getting ready to uh, enter college. And um, <clears throat> if there's anything that she taught me, it was how to be sentimental. Um, she saved everything. She uh, uh, took me in as if I was her own granddaughter and um, took me to the Worthington Inn, took me to uh, uh, a tea room here in Worthington that I'd never been before and uh, took, a, took me on a date. And all of these grandkids will know exactly what I'm talking about. Um, she would take us on dates, and it was just the two of us. And uh, we were at this tea room and uh, got to dress up in a little boa and uh, just have tea together. And um, she had just such kind words. And I just remember feeling having grandparents uh, that put this type of effort into you as a grandchild is very special. It's something that not a lot of people get, and how sweet and how uh, special to have those moments with her. And uh, as we continued moving forward, as I said, I started into college and moved down to Tennessee, and I've been there ever since. And 
uh, every so often we'd just connect and she'd call she'd say how are you doing uh, and we'd just have little dates on the phone and we'd just talk it through and um, she just always had such such encouragement and I will tell you that uh, every time I came here to visit Ohio we always went on those dates and uh, I will never forget those moments those sentiments uh, that we shared together uh, and as I continued to grow up I graduated in college she was there for every event uh, graduation I got married she walked down as my grandmother and um, now I have a little girl her her great-granddaughter and uh, Again, those sentimental moments. Uh, we, we got home from the hospital, and in the mail, something I would have never thought about was uh, a care package from her. It was a sweet little outfit, and it was every news publication you could think of for September 28 of 2017 of when Riley was born. And that's stuff that I will remember forever and cherish. And again, if there's anything she taught me, it was to be sentimental and not to take anything for granted to remember the people that you have in your life, and they're there for a special reason. And let's not forget those times. Thank you. What an emotional day, but an exciting day as well. Emotional this morning, because we laid to rest a beautiful woman. Um, her and I share a lot. Um, I'm a police officer, and she has the utmost respect for me. She would take me out to dinner all the time, and she just like, boy, you can't fool me. What's on your mind? And we literally sit there and talk for hours. And she never judged me, and she never has. She brought me in as her own. She loved me just like she loves everybody. And that's someone I felt comfortable talking to and always will. She always joked. She's like, so when am I going to see you in live PD? Guess what? She's going to see me every day now. She's going to be looking over me, be right there with me. Um, I remember coming to this church as a little guy. Um, she wasn't my grandma at the time, but I knew who she was. Then I got blessed with another grandma. Like my sister said a second ago, she sent a birthday card. She, she brought us in, and that's something we, I can't explain. I've tried so hard to come up with something to write, but I couldn't because she knows I just wing it. I go with it, and um, I just want to say... I, I go out there every day, I deal with kind of all kinds of crazy people, and I've never met such a beautiful woman like her with such a kind soul. And that's something we all can agree on, because she has some positive impact on our lives. So I appreciate you guys sharing her with me. Love you, Mary Fran. All right, so I'm Olivia Shuley. Kind soul and I have made so many memories together. Whether it be a Starbucks run, a trip to the Ohio Historical Society, or baking together in the kitchen. Today, I want to share with you a few of my favorite memories. First of all, Graham was always correcting my grammar since I was little. Now that being said, she hasn't had the chance to check this assignment, so you'll have to forgive me if I make any mistakes. There were times that Graham would give us about 50 pennies, and every time we said the word like or um, she would take a penny back. I usually ended up with little to no pennies, and of course, Quentin always won that game. <laughs> now, you knew you were in for a doozy if she would start a story with, now stop me if I've told you this before, or to make a long story short, no matter what, you were going to hear that story in its entirety. <laughs> if you know Graham, you know she loves her stories. We recently went into a store and she claimed the cashier was talking her ear off. I'm very sure it was the other way around, but I just went with it. Another memory I have of her is when I would be so excited to come home to the smell of fresh baked cookies and she would say, I have a tester ready for you. And I would respond with, I'm going to do a lot more than just have one tester. Because oatmeal raisins were my favorite, and those are pretty healthy anyways, right? <laughs> um, just as Dominic said, for our birthdays, Graham would take us on different mystery trips. It was always interesting to see where we would end up. A couple of my trips were to the Dublin Irish Festival, 
The Pooch Parade, Olentangy Indian cabin, Caverns, or a movie. It was her special way to give us a unique birthday. Kind Soul was really patient with me and taught me how to sew my own doll clothes together. She was also patient when she was teaching me to bake, as I spilled ingredients across the counter, down the cabinet, on the floor. It's obvious I get my baking skills from my mom. <laughs> Mrs. O, I don't know how you dealt with her at camp. <laughs> kind soul led by example on how to act and how to be a good person. She always said Sabbath was a day for doing good deeds. Oftentimes, she would go visit homebound patients, people on the sunshine list at church, and she would even go keep people company that she didn't know in the nursing homes. There was one Christmas Eve that she took Quentin, Dominic, and I to a nursing home to take people cookies and cards to cheer them up. At first, I thought this would be pretty boring, a way to spend Christmas Eve, but it turned out to be a very meaningful experience to me. Over the last year, Graham was still staying busy, sorting her papers, calling old classmates, or making pit cells. But let me tell you, when 4 o'clock would hit, Dr. Phil came on, and there was no time for interruptions. Seriously, you did not want to bother her. She taught me always to be positive no matter what, and not to let others affect my behavior. She told me multiple times, that some people are just mad the sun came up today. Not once did she ever complain about her condition of health. She was always concerned about others. Kind soul was the perfect example of selflessness, kind-hearted, and she was a loving individual. There is not anything she wouldn't do for you. This is how she earned her nickname, Kind Soul. I wish I could go to Grader's with Graham one last time or grab a bite to eat at the Worthington Inn together. However, I can't tell you how grateful I am to know she is no longer suffering, but instead she will soon be able to see the love of her life, Grampy Bob, and she will be with Jesus where she's always wanted to be. Thank you. Olivia, you owe Graham like 14 pennies for likes and ums. <laughs> <laughs> Stand up. 
mountains you raised me up to walk on stormy seas I am strong when I am on your shoulders you raise me up to more than I can be you raise me up so I can stand on mountains you raise me up to walk on stormy seas I am strong when I am on your shoulders you raise me up to more than I can be. You raise me up. You raise me up to walk on stormy seas. I am strong when I am on your shoulders. You raise me up more than I can be. You raise me up to more than I can be. My name is uh, Julian, and I'm the pastor of Mary Friend. As a matter of fact, she asked me to preach on her funeral. So today I have three short points and a poem for you. And at least through one of the points, I would like uh, you to hear the voice of uh, Mary Friend. At least the gist of what uh, she would like to, you to hear. So the first point is very short and clear. Today, the world is poorer. The world is poorer because Mary Fran's face is not among us to shine with her smile, to warm us with her embrace and to encourage us. Today, this morning, our church was poorer. I'm so used to look at her and see the reflection of what I'm preaching and, and see the encouraging of, of her smile because I know what she's going to tell me after the sermon. You did well, and I prayed for you. Today was the first Sabbath. I missed that. And I felt distracted the second service. It, it was not the same. Today I felt our church was poor. And today um, my family is poor. You see, Mary Friend is uh, the only soul on this side of the big pond that can make Bulgarian cookies that taste like my mom's cookies. <laughs> I still remember on the very first uh, Pastor's Appreciation uh, Month, it was Mary Frank who brought me these cookies and she said, I hope they, they look like Bulgarian cookies. Somehow she found online what a Bulgarian cookie looked like, how you bake them and how you, you make them, and she did an amazing job. I tasted them and I felt like I'm eating the cookies that my mom used to make for us. 
So my first point is, today the world is poorer. Because Mary Fran is not physically here with us. My, my second point is, today the, the world is richer. Today the world is richer than when Mary Fran entered it uh, 80 something years ago. And this world is richer because of her. She has left a legacy that will be remembered and I know has changed many lives, at least mine. Today our church is spiritually wealthier than before uh, 1969 when she joined the Seventh Adventist Church. Because with her warmth, she transformed the culture of all the people who came in touch with her. Today, my family is richer because of Mary Fran. Because she proves to me that true godliness exists. And I'm telling you as a pastor, this is one of the things that I get discouraged the most. When you pour your heart in preaching and ministering to people and you see so many people that are not godlike. And Mary Fran was uh, like a f uh, breath of fresh air for my pastoral ministry, just looking at her and seeing this thing that we read in, in the Bible of godlikeness is possible because of her. Today my family is richer. Because she came in, in, uh, in the life of my family in a time that was very difficult for my mother. Three years ago my mom was diagnosed with cancer and Mary Fran came and just told me, give me your mom's address. And mind you, uh, I'm uh, born and raised in Bulgaria, my mom speaks zero English. And Mary Fran started writing her these letters every month. And sometimes, I don't know if uh, some of the grandchildren helped her or she somehow figured out how Google Translate works. But she was scribbling uh, words in Cyrillic letters and saying a few, few things to my mom in Bulgarian. Just to encourage her during her battle with cancer. And when, when six months ago my mom died, I came back and Mary Fran brought this stack of envelopes and very fancy, um, very fancy stamps. I've never seen such fancy uh, post stamps that she has bought to keep on sending letters to my mom. And today you are a testament that Mary Fran has enriched your lives, otherwise you would have not been here. So my second point is this world is richer because of Mary Fran and her legacy. But now I'd like to make my third point to, to preach on behalf of Mary Fran. And if I have to uh, state the, the point shortly before I start, make your priorities straight and make them count. The wisest man that has ever lived writes this way. It is better to spend your time at funerals than at parties. After all, everyone dies. So the living should take this by heart. Sorrow is better than laughter. For sadness has refining influence on all of us. A wise person thinks a lot about death, but a fool thinks only about having a good time and parties. Death is always an interruption, even when you have expected it. It never comes in a con at a convenient time. And it's so strange how we human beings are wired 
We always think that death is something that happens to other people, but will never touch me. We don't like to grow old. We don't like to think of our mortality. And yet, according to the wisest human being that has lived on this planet, thinking about death changes our priorities of life. A Mary friend asked me in our last uh, meeting with her just about uh, 10 days ago, would you please tell everybody that nothing matters more than loving Jesus? Nothing matters more than the hope of his second coming, that everything else pales in comparison with that. So today, on behalf of Mary Fran and her Savior, I would like to ask you to set your priorities straight. Don't be a fool. Think about the things that matter in life. A deceased friend, a deceased mom, a deceased grandma preaches a very silent but powerful sermon. We desperately need a savior. And Mary Friend found the savior who held her hand as she was bringing her last and whispered the promise in her ear that when he comes in glory, he is going to bring her back to life. Many people live as they will never die, and die as if they have never lived. Are you one of them? Today, on behalf of uh, Mary Fran, I would like to ask you, don't let her hanging out there on the day of, of the resurrection. She who cared so much about you, to minister in so many ways to you, to love you in so many ways to you, right now in this world, can you imagine how much you're going to hurt her if you waste your life here and do not meet her in the day of the resurrection? Don't disappoint her. She's going to be looking for you. She's going to be looking for me. Live a life that will leave a lasting legacy, that will leave priorities that will make others think about the meaning of their lives. So this is my third point. Make your priorities straight and let Jesus be number one. Do not make a, a person, do not make a business, do not make anything else a priority. Do not make anything a priority that can be taken away from you. Make the priority the one who holds in his hand eternity and your happiness in your eternal life. Don't disappoint Mary friend. And finally, I told you I have three points. I just shared them with you, and I have a poem. So here it is. Remember me. Speak of me as you have always done. Remember the good times, the laughter, and the fun. Share the happy memories, memories we made. Do not let them wither. Please, do not let them fade. I'm peaceful now. Put your mind at ease. I rested my eyes. I've gone to sleep. But the memories we've shared are yours to keep. Sometimes our final days may have been a test, but remember me when I was at my best. Although things may not be the same, don't be afraid to use my name. Let your sorrow last just for a while and comfort each other and smile. I've lived a life filled with joy and fun. Live on now. Make me proud 
of what you have become.
Friends, on behalf of the Shuli family, I would like to invite you after the benediction uh, to join us in the fellowship hall for some refreshments. And at this time, I would like to ask you to stand up on your feet and to bow your heads uh, for the benediction. May the road rise to meet you. May the wind be always at your back. May the sun shine warm upon your face. May the rain fall soft upon your fields. And until we meet again, may God hold you in the palm of his hand. Amen. Thank you.